Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mobile Robot Systems course. In this third lecture, we will be talking about robot motion control. In particular, we will look at motion control in the case of differential drive robots, and we'll derive both forward and inverse kinematics models for such platforms. Finally, at the end, I'll also touch upon open versus closed loop control variants. Without further ado, let's get started. So in this lecture, we will talk about the methods that allow us to control mobile robots. And in order to understand those methods, we will go through a couple of key concepts. The first concept we will talk about are motion models. Understanding motion models will then allow us to understand the mathematical concept of forward and inverse kinematics which will in turn allow us to do something that is called uh, trajectory tracking. And we'll look at various ways of doing trajectory tracking, one of which will be uh, looking at open loop control versus closed loop control. And at the very end, I will end uh, with a couple of slides on PID control, since this, this is one of the most um, advanced or sophisticated ways of executing closed loop control on robotic platforms. So as previously, I would like to put the content of this lecture into the context of the course as a whole. So what we'll be talking about here is the action component and how that translates directly, directly to motion control. So how to control robot actuators. And in specific, we will be focusing on controlling mobile robots in the two-dimensional plane. So let's talk a little bit about actuators. So actuators can have different purposes, one of which uh, is locomotion. So this is the most common type of actuator where we have different types of actuators that actually facilitate this. So we can think of wheels, which is probably the first thing that you think of when, when you think of um, locomotion. But of course, the legged robots are becoming very popular because of their uh, ability of moving through very difficult spaces and uh, being able to do nimble things such as walk up and down stairs. And there's also a type of lo locomotion called slipstick, which is popular on very low cost, low power platforms such as the Kilobot. And the way that slipstick works is basically by actuating the individual little sticks on this um, uh, suspended or supported platform by vibrating the sticks to de different degrees and the friction or the slip that this uh, creates or causes on the surface allows the robot to slip in different directions in a very controlled manner. So slipstick is, an actually, is actually a very interesting way of actuating simple robots in, in the plane. Um, other types of, look of motion include manipulation. So arms are a type of, uh, or rely on, on manipulators to actuate and manipulate objects. Um, and other types of actuation include things such as heating or sound emission, right? So it's not only when we see motion, um, that it means that something is being actuated. So a couple of examples of electrical to mechanical actuators include DC motors, stepper motors, servos, and uh, loudspeakers. Um, in this course, you will um, focus mainly on DC motors or robots that rely on DC motors and stepper motors, because those are the most common ways of actuating uh, wheels. And a very key concept um, in terms of actuation is what does the actuator rely on uh, in terms of control input, right? So what control inputs um, do we have to give a robot in order for it um, to actuate its various actuators so that it creates the desired motion um, or actuation that we are hoping um, to see it perform or execute? So as an example, um, a driver who is the controller of a car or a vehicle has two possible control inputs with which it can control a car. So it can steer the car um, by controlling the steering wheel. And the driver also has the option of accelerating, either positively or negatively, right? So going faster or braking. So a driver basically acts as uh, the, the person or the agent who is able to control the two control inputs of a vehicle that moves in planar space. Now, a very important concept um, or a thing to, to realize or recognize um, and acknowledge is that actuation isn't perfect and it is susceptible to uncertainty. 
whereby by uncertainty we think of, for example, in the case of wheels, wheels are susceptible to slip. So wheels don't stick perfectly on their underlying surfaces. So you typically would actuate more than the wheel ends up moving forwards on the underlying surface due to slip. There is also the fact that mechanisms contain slack, which is completely normal. So actuation, some energy that gets put into the actuation gets lost. And of course, cheap actuators um, rely on circuitry that is perhaps not perfect and hence the actuation signal is perhaps also not perfect and hence some information gets lo lost along the transmission from control to execution. <clears throat> and finally, actua actuation is not perfect because it also is affected by external stressors such as wind, friction, etc., which means that the control input you exert on the actuators is not necessarily what you get or what you see. All right. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about um, degrees of freedom, which are an important concept and lead to another um, whole subsequent uh, set of important concepts in the framework of robotics. So every robot has a specific number of degrees of freedom. So what does that mean? Um, so typically you think of an actuator controlling one single degree of freedom, right? So we can think of a motor shaft controlling one rotational degree of freedom, right? So a motor shaft allows a, some turning um, contraption, some, some contraption to turn around its axis or um, an actuator might um, be a sliding part on a plotter that controls one single translation, translational degree of freedom. So as I mentioned before, every robot has a specific number of degrees of freedom. And it's important to note that um, there is this concept of controllability. So if every actuator um, can, con or the other way around, actually, if every robot degree of freedom is actuatable by one of its actuators, then we say of the robot that it owns controllable degrees of freedom, right? And I'll say a little bit more about this in a second because it really leads to a couple of very important concepts within the context of uh, robot motion. So let's do a, a quick Gedanken experiment here um, where we're looking at two different robot types. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at a differential drive robot, which is a robot that can essentially uh, um, execute or actuate its two wheels independently, which allows it to turn around its axis. So that would be our omega. And it also allows it um, to move um, uh, in the two-dimensional plane. So what is the number of degrees of freedom of a differential drive robot? And at this point, I'd like you to, to just take a minute to think about this or a few seconds um, and perhaps stop um, the video to do this. So the answer to the question is that a differential drive robot has three degrees of freedom because it has a position in two dimensions and which it can control, control and it also has a heading which it can control, right? Now, the second robot that we're looking at here is basically just a fixed rotating joint, right? And so how many degrees of freedom can this robot control? Or how many uh, degrees of freedom does this robot have? And I'd like you to take a second to think about this. So in this particular case, the answer is two, because the robot can only control the two-dimensional position of its end effector. Right? So if we think of this extremity, which is marked by x, y, this could be the tip of a finger or the end of a manipulating arm. And its position is the only thing that you can control by these two uh, movable rotating joints. So the degrees of freedom here that our manipulator arm or this fixed rotating joint is presenting us are equal to two. Okay. So, an important concept that I'd like to introduce to you now is the concept of holonomicity. And to understand holonomicity, we need to understand what uh, it means to have a certain degree of mobility. So degrees of mobility are equal to the differentiable degrees of freedom that a robot owns. So what does that mean? So the di differentiable degrees of freedom are the number of degrees of freedom that can be directly accessed by the robot's actuators. 
And because of this, the degrees of mobility are upper bounded by the degrees of freedom, right? So if a robot in the plane has three degrees of freedom, it will have at most three degrees of mobility, which would be its position in X and Y and its heading. Now, not all robots have the same number of degrees of mobility as they have degrees of freedom. And that is where we differentiate between holonomic robots and non-holonomic robots, and also redundant robots. So a holonomic robot is a robot that has an equal number of degrees of freedom to degrees of mobility, right? Which essentially means it can move in all of the directions of the, if it's degrees of freedom through um, its actuation capabilities directly, right? And a non-holonomic robot is a robot that has a greater number of degrees of freedom than it has degrees of mobility. So in other words, non-holonomic robots are robots that are somehow constrained. And this is a very important idea that you need to hold on to when we talk about motion control. And we also have a third option, which is when a robot's degrees of mobility are larger than its degrees of freedom. And in those cases, these robots are called redundant um, robots or robots with redundant actuation. And this type of mobility is often seen when we have uh, robot arms, where essentially you might want to be able to move an end effector to an end position, so potentially in 2D or 3D. But there are many moving joints um, uh, that allow the robot to have a very nimble actuator to perhaps fit through holes, etc., which mean that it has a much larger number of degrees of mobility than degrees of freedom. And such robots are then called redundant. But in this course, we will focus mainly on motion control in the plane or in 3D, and hence we won't be focusing um, too much on the question of or on the idea of what a redundant robot um, is. So let's look at the example of a differential drive robot. So a differential drive robot is a robot that has um, a left and a right wheel that it can actuate independently, right? And the um, degrees of freedom that this robot has, if it lives in the planar, in planar space, are essentially its X and Y positions and its heading, right? So these are the three degrees of freedom that our robot has. Now, if we think about how this robot can actually move in space, it becomes immediately obvious to us that one degree of freedom, which would be the exposition in the body frame, is directly accessible by the robot's actuators, right? Because it can just actuate left and right wheels equally and it's moving along this x-axis. But the y direction, which is orthogonal to, this, to the x-axis, is an inaccessible degree of freedom. So the robot cannot slide along the y-axis. So this degree of freedom in the two-dimensional plane here is inaccessible in terms of the robot's mobility capabilities. And of course, a rotational, the heading is accessible through the robot's actuators, through its rotational capabilities, given that it can turn left and right wheels independently. So the heading is an accessible um, degree of freedom. So again, just to summarize, so this differential drive robot has three degrees of freedom, but its degrees of mobility are only two. Hence, a differential drive robot is a non-holonomic robot. And this means that it's a constrained robot, right? So the impact of non-holonomicity is that the motion constraints will affect how we can actually execute our motion planning. Because essentially, if you think about it, a, motion, uh, a robot that is unconstrained can move in any direction um, in, its, uh, in the dimensionality in which it lives in an unconstrained way. So your planning is simplified. However, if you have a robot that is constrained in the way of its motion, you have to think of things such as planning curves or ways to get to the positions that you desire your robots to go to in a way that are achievable given the robot's actuators. Okay? So given that we've established this notion of holonomicity or non-holonomicity, I'd like you to take a second to think about these three other types of vehicles. So, is a train a holonomic vehicle? And the answer to that is yes. So, a train is a holonomic vehicle because it has one degree of freedom, right? It can move along its rails, and it also has one de um, degree of mobility. It can accelerate and decelerate along the, this exact same uh, dimension.
Now, is a car a holonomic vehicle? And here the answer is no, it isn't, right? So if you think about um, the car in terms of simplified um, motion model, so you could think of um, the bicycle model as a paradigm for the car's motion model, where we have its position, x and y, and theta, an angle, for example, being um, the state or the, the, the heading of, of the wheel that you're controlling, of, 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 the, of one single front wheel, for example, right? So those could represent the degrees of freedom of a simplified car model. Now, what are the control inputs? Well, we only have two control inputs because we're moving along our x-axis along the body frame, and we can control the direction or the heading of our front wheel. So those are our two, two control inputs. And since we only have two control inputs, but we have three degrees of freedom, the car or the car in a simplified representation as a bicycle is a non-holonomic vehicle, right? So, and the last example is the quad rotor, right? So is it the quad rotor a holonomic robot? And so the answer is perhaps counterintuitively at first, no. So let's think about the degrees of freedom that a quad rotor has. So the quad rotor lives in three dimensional space. So we start off with three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. And the quad rotor can also control roll, pitch, and yaw. So altogether we have six degrees of freedom. And then if we think about how many actuators that the quad rotor has, well, the name actually gives it away because it only has four. Right? So we have four actuators, but we have six degrees of freedom. And so the degrees of mobility are four, which is less than six. And hence, the quad is a non-holonomic robot. But another way of thinking about this um, in a more intuitive manner is if you have a quad rotor hovering and you want it to translate horizontally, um, keeping the same Z, um, Z quantity, for example, what you would need to do is you need to tilt the robot so that the thrust allows it to propel along this horizontal direction, right? And when you want the quad rotor to, to break, you'll tilt it in the other direction so that it stops its thrust along that X direction. And so you see that the motion that the quad rotor has to execute isn't just a sliding along a horizontal X axis. It has to execute motion that is a little bit more complicated in order to overcome its motion constraints. Okay. And so this course focuses mainly on wheel robots. And so I just like to talk a little bit more about the different types of wheeled locomotion that we can think of in the case of uh, mobile robots moving on wheels in the plane, right? And so clearly the important thing to take away from this slide is that the, diff the wheel types that we deploy on our robots will affect the robot's holonomicity. So if we look at the first example, we have a robot that has three omnidirectional wheels, which means that the robot has three degrees of mobility. In the case of the classical differential drive robot, we have two differential um, drive wheels and we have a caster wheel, which means that the robot only has two degrees of mobility and hence is non-holonomic. And then we have three different um, additional types of robots, uh, one called omnisteer, one called tricycle, and one called two-steer. Two of these robot platforms um, end up having three degrees of mobility and the tricycle itself only has two degrees of mobility. So you see here the choice of wheel that we use to deploy in a robot affects its holonomicity. Now clearly you might be thinking, well, um, having a holonomic robot is, is clearly always the simplest thing to do, but it turns out that having more complicated wheel designs um, also has its consequences and hence a lot of um, robot designers do not always um, prefer or give preference to fully holonomic um, robot platform designs. But at this point, you actually might be wondering, what does a, a fully holonomic ground robot actually look like? And I'm not sure if all of us have already come across such platforms. And because of that, I'd just like to show you a movie um, of robots uh, that are holonomic um, to show you what, what these um, uh, robots can actually do.
And so you can see that the various motions or configurations um, that these robots can drive in are extremely elegant and sophisticated. And you can even imagine how these kinds of mobility paradigms might be extremely useful in tight and cluttered spaces, such as warehouses, um, where you need to move around stuff and you don't have a lot of um, maneuvering space to do so. So now we're going to talk about kinematics. So in general, in this course, we will mainly be sticking to first order systems, which are velocity controlled as opposed to controlled through acceleration. Uh, in other words, dynamics. So we're not going to be focusing on dynamics, but to keep things simpler, we will focus on kinematics. And kinematics are described through first order systems. Um, so to get us started, I'll give a very small reminder of what first order systems are. So in this figure, we're showing the distance versus time for an accelerating robot. The slope here is giving us the average speed over a time interval. And we can see an increase in the slope, which directly corresponds to an increase in velocity. Now, since we know that uh, or I'm telling you that here we have implemented an equation that says that s of t is equal to t squared, we know that the acceleration is constant. Okay? And the equations that we will be working with are, on, are going to be based on simple change equations. So chain, by change equations, I mean differential equations where we will consider instantaneous change. So for infinitesimally small segments, where we can consider acceleration speed at a single point in time, um, we can re represent these changes as derivatives. Okay, so differential equations will be our workhorse for uh, the remainder of everything that relates to control. So I'd now like to introduce uh, a first useful concept um, in the context of robot motion, which is forward kinematics. So what does forward kinematics do? So the question that forward, forward kinematics answers is, given the control parameters, for example, wheel velocities and the time of movement, t, find a pose, x, y, theta, reached by the robot. Okay? So in other words, if you know how the robot moves, then you know where the robot will end up after a time t, barring any uncertainties, right? So that is what forward um, kinematics does for us. Now, a more interesting concept within the context of motion control is that of inverse kinematics, which arguably also is a slightly harder problem and we'll look a little bit more into detail um, in this lecture today. So the question of inverse kinematics is, given a final desired pose, x, y, theta, find the control parameters that allow us to move the robot there to that desired pose at a given time t. Or in other words, you know how you can control the robot and you know where it wants, where it's supposed to go. So what is the control that you have to exert to get that robot there um, at time t? Okay. So this is the inverse kinematic problem is the control problem that we will uh, be concerned with. So first of all, we really need to understand what it means uh, to control a robot. And in order to do that, we will start with the very basics of kinematics, which begins by understanding what a motion model actually is. So what does a motion model do for us? So a motion model is basically a set of differential equations that describe how the state of a robot changes in the world. Okay? So at this, in this panel here, we're looking at uh, two different examples of two different um, robot platforms that each have their own um, motion model. So if we look first at the motion model of the differential drive robot, what we can see here is how this motion model describes the robot's state change with respect to time as a function of a control input or several control inputs. So on the left-hand side of the system of equations, 
we have our degrees of freedom, right? So you'll recall we have our X and Y, which are our positions in 2D um, state space, and theta, which is our heading. And um, we're differentiating them with respect to time, right? Because that's our change equation. And on the right-hand side of the system of equations, we, we show how this change relates to our control inputs. And in this case, our control inputs are u, which is forwards velocity, and omega, which is our rotational velocity, okay, or our angular velocity. Now, if we try to introspect um, the formulas a little bit more closely, we can actually see that they're very easily derived through uh, first principles trigonometry. Okay? And uh, where omega here simply reflects the instantaneous change in orientation and is directly a control input in this case. Now, on the right-hand side, we have a slightly more um, sophisticated example. So this is a bicycle model. Uh, which again has three degrees of freedom, two of which are controllable. Um, and the way the bicycle changes its state in X and Y is analogous to how the differential drive robot changes its state in X and Y. And the difference here is how the bicycle would change its heading in this global um, state space, whereby here the heading depends not only on a rotational velocity, but it depends on the the heading of the front wheel and the forwards velocity v. Again, um, these quantities uh, can be derived um, through simple uh, trigonomic principles. So now I'd like to add a quick side note on first order models versus second order models, um, especially because sometimes first order models tend to be not sufficient or um, so, uh, sophisticated enough abstractions to model certain types of robot platforms. So just a quick uh, reminder, what, what is a first order model? So a first order model is one that um, only considers first derivatives, which corresponds to kinematics and neglects dynamics, right? So what a second order model does for us is it also models the second derivatives. And um, obviously, um, in some cases where forces are important, uh, for example, in the case of quadrotors or robots that are um, exposed to forces such as gravity, um, second order models uh, tend to be the way to go. So let's have a look at exa an, an example of a motion model in the case where we actually need to model uh, dynamics um, through, through second derivatives and second order models. So looking at this example here, we're, we're actually considering a quadrotor. Um, and recall that this robot platform uh, lives in a six dimensional space. So it has six degrees of freedom of which four are controllable. So we have four degrees of mobility. So the six degrees of freedom are roll pitch yaw and X, Y, Z. And the controllable inputs are the four quadrotors thrusts, right? Now let's have a look at um, the motion model. Um, not in detail, but just to give you an example of why we need these second derivatives. So R is a vector uh, that is pointing to the robot's X, Y, Z uh, position, say at its center of mass. And our dot dot is a twice differentiated um, vector pointing to how this uh, position, uh, well, or what, the, what the acceleration is um, in three dimensional space, right? Now this, our dot dot, um, our, our differentiated differentiated twice with respect to time um, is equal to a, uh, an equation which is composed of two terms. Um, at a high level, we're looking at the first term, which corresponds to a gravity force, and the second term, which corresponds to a quadrotor force. And then in the second equation, we're looking at omega dot, which is the angular acceleration in roll, pitch, and yaw, which then depends on inertia and uh, the robot's uh, control inputs. Okay. So this is just um, a high-level representation of a second-order model for robot platforms that are not sufficiently modeled through first-order models. So now I want to go back to um, our forwards kinematics problem, and I'd like to start by deriving the equations of a forwards kinematics model for a differential drive robot. So first recall that a differential drive robot has two actuators, right? It actuates its left wheel and its right wheel independently. So first, what we want to do 
is we would like to understand how to relate our high level inputs, which are our forwards velocity u and our angular velocity omega, to the actual controllable actuators that the robot has, right? So we want to relate u and omega to the left and right wheel speeds, okay? So this is the first thing that we're gonna do. So if we look at the first um, two equations on the left-hand side of this panel, um, we see first that the forwards velocity is equal to the average of the two wheels of forwards velocity, where r um, is the radius of the wheel, um, multiplied by the angular velocity of the wheel, um, divided by two, uh, plus the same thing for the other wheel, is uh, then equal to the robot's um, forwards velocity given that uh, in its own um, robot body frame, right? Uh, the second equation tells us what the rotational velocity is of the robot in its robot body frame um, by simply taking the difference of velocities between these two wheels, right? Um, and just a side note here, phi dot um, is, uh, denotes the angular velocity of, of our respective robot wheels. Now, what the rotational velocity tells us is um, that it's, it's greater for small, smaller axle lengths, right? So the smaller this axle length d is, the greater the rotational velocity is for a given fixed um, angular wheel velocity, right? So these two equations relate u and omega, which are high-level control inputs, to the actual control inputs that the robot will exert on its wheels. Um, and what we will do next is use these high-level control inputs, u and omega, to describe the change of the robot's state in its local body frame, right? So that's the coordinate system that the robot is carrying with it wherever it moves and is centered at its uh, center of mass. Okay. And so just to summarize the slide, what we now have is a motion model, right? So this is the set of differential equations on the right-hand side of the model panel that describes how the robot state changes in its own local um, coordinate system, so in its body frame. So what we're going to do next now is we're going to use this motion model described within the robot's body frame to devise a system of equations that describe the robot state change in a global coordinate system, in a world frame. Okay? And so we're going to use or leverage the equations for change in the body frame in order to do that, right? And so basically the question that we're going to answer here is, given that we know control inputs um, with, that tell us how the robot moves with respect um, uh, to its own body frame, how do we use that to leverage um, a model that describes robot change in a global coordinate system? And the answer to, uh, to that question or to that problem is very simple because all we have to do is now transform my body frame coordinates to world frame coordinates um, to understand how this transformation or to, if, to execute this transformation from one system to another. And we will do this by simply multiplying the robot's state vector with a transformation matrix which in this case is a rotation matrix, denoted by T of theta, um, which allows you to transform coordinates from one vector space into another. And I'd like to just give you a bit of an intuition behind this rotation matrix. I'll, let the ex I'll, give, I'll give you the exercise of actually deriving it um, for something you, for you to do outside of this lecture. Um, so the intuition behind the rotation matrix is that you can look at the two-dimensional case and you'll see that the columns actually represent the coordinate system of the new rotated uh, vectors. Okay? So in the next step, what we do is we simply replace the robot state in its local body frame, so x sub b, y sub b, theta sub b, with my control inputs u and omega, as we established on uh, the previous slide. right? And by doing that, I then get this new equation, um, which can be simplified. And uh, the, the result of this simplified equation, so we have our x dot, y dot, uh, theta dot, which is the robot state change in the global coordinate frame, equal to u times cos theta, u times uh, sin theta, and, um, and omega. This now is our final forwards kinematics model in the global coordinate system, right? 
So this is a powerful result because now, given inputs um, u and omega and a current orientation theta, I can tell you how the robot moves in the world frame. So that's our forwards kinematics model. So next, what I would like to do is to derive the equations for an inverse kinematics model, since we also want to be able to do the inverse of forwards kinematics, which is to find out what the control inputs are that yield a specific motion or lead the robot um, into a specific state in the world frame, right? So this is a very important or foundational problem within the field of robotics. So in other words, um, mathematically, what we need to do is we need to now back out our control inputs, u and omega, from our forwards um, kinematics model, so from our motion equation. And the answer to this is actually very simple uh, because we will do this by simply using an inverse uh, transformation matrix, um, which is here denoted by t um, power minus one. Um, and you can see here that um, the equation, when simplified, um, is denoted very simply by u equals x dot theta theta. Um, x dot cos cosine theta plus y dot sinus theta and omega equals uh, theta dot, right? So this here is now, uh, if when, when simplified, is the equation for um, our motion for, for our inverse kinematics in the global world frame. Um, and now what we can do simply um, is extend these maths to get the equations uh, that lead us to our low-level control inputs for the left and right wheel speeds, uh, replacing our high-level inputs u and omega simply by using or by plugging in the equations that we derived a few slides ago, right? So we can then use phi dot um, left, phi dot right, um, replace the equations, and we now have um, the equations for uh, phi dot and um, phi dot left, phi dot right, that describe how the robot moves in uh, the uh, global state, uh, in, the, in a global coordinate system. So this is a nice equation because in summary, if you now want to move your robot um, uh, state, for example, in X and Y and theta by a certain amount, then those are the quantities of, uh, of wheel motion, essentially, that you're going to exert on the robot's wheels. Right Now, there is a bit of a, a but here, a, a, a side note that we need to recall and take into consideration, and it's a very important one. Um, what, I, what I'd like to stress here is that our robot, or we have derived or we have shown that a differential drive robot is non-holonomic, which means that um, we cannot change um, the Y in the robot's body frame um, arbitrarily. So in other words, for any change in Y sub B, so in Y in the robot's body frame, there must be a change in X in the robot's body frame. Okay, so this is a constraint. And this constraint um, can be represented by this equation here in the global coordinate frame, um, which says that X dot sinus theta must be equal to Y dot cosine theta. So this equation here captures the non-holonomicity constraint of a differential drive robot. So now the question is, following up on our inverse kinematics equations, um, I would like, or I have a specific goal point in the world frame that I want my robot to reach, right? So we have our change equations, but we haven't actually fully derived uh, the final for inverse kinematics model that tells us how our robot is actually going to reach a specific state. And given that I have a goal pose in the world coordinate frame denoted by um, the state sub G here, um, I would like to find out what the control is that I need to exert next. So the question is, given x sub g, um, y sub g, theta sub g, how am I going to get my instantaneous change equation? So my x dots, y dots, theta dots. Okay? And what we're going to do in this slide here is we're going to use a simple proportional control law um, in order to uh, back this out. Right. So if we look at that equation here, um, 
capital K is a control gain, which is multiplying the difference in the robot's current state and our desired state, so our desired a goal state. So this difference here corresponds to our current error, right? And by um, stating that this current error is equal to our change equation, what we're going to do is we're going to be correcting that error, right? We're going to be trying to make it smaller, right? Um, and a key thing to note here is that we're assuming that we have some sort of oracle that tells us what our robot's current true state is. So we have access to our x, y, and theta, right? So assume we have an eye in the sky or something that tells us we, what our robot state is in the global coordinate frame, right? Um, so what we do now is we take this right-hand side of the equation and I plug it into the equation that I derived on the previous slide to know what I have to input for control laws u and omega. And that is the solution to our inverse kinematics model if we're given a specified um, robot state um, in the global coordinate frame. So now the tricky thing is that uh, the robot is not holonomic. It's a non-holonomic platform. And as I already alluded to in the previous slide, we need to satisfy this non-holonomicity constraint. Um, so one way we can solve this is by thinking of a plan that we know is feasible given this non-holonomicity constraint um, in order that, so that allows us to generate feasible velocities, x dot, y dot, theta dot, right? So basically to satisfy um, this constraint, what we need to somehow satisfy is that the robot is continuously moving forwards, right? We're not changing y dot sub b without changing x dot sub b, okay? So the idea that we're going to leverage um, uh, is going to be to generate an analytical equation for x of t so that we can then derive and obtain our x dots and validate that constraints are, are met. Right? So there are actually many approaches towards satisfying non holonomicity constraints. And what we'll do next is just look at one possible uh, solution to this problem um, to give you an example of a way that one could implement um, this. So basically, to satisfy uh, this constraint, what we want to do is we want to be, uh, what well, we need to be creative, right? And, and as I mentioned before, there are a number of different ways that we can actually do this. Um, one possible way is, for example, uh, so one way to generate these derivatives so that they are valid for the specific robot platform that we're considering is by generating a continuous trajectory. And so the key here is really to generate these uh, velocities so that they're feasible. So velocities x dot, y dot, theta dot. So we can start by generating an analytical equation for x of t, and then derive um, to obtain derive it to obtain the x dots, um, etc., and validate the constraints are satisfied. Now, um, clearly there are various ways that we might be able to achieve this. And Bezier curves, curves here are an example I'm just going to um, illustrate at a high level. And they're just one possible solution um, towards this problem of providing uh, a continuous trajectory that is differentiable and feasible in the first derivatives for the robot, right? So what we want to do is that we, with Bezier curves, is we want to ensure that the the robot waypoints on this curve lie on a feasible trajectory. Okay, so that's what the Bezier curves are going to do for us. Now, Bezier curves are parametrized by four um, parameters, so P1 to P4, and we can derive these four um, parameters um, in order to uh, make sure that the robot's capabilities um, are uh, are satisfied essentially. So P1 and P4 are start and ending points um, and P2 and P3 then depend on the robot's orientation at these points. And these two equations here for P1 and P2 are the ones that are going to uh, um, satisfy our non holonomicity constraints in the case of a differential drive robot, right? So I'm not actually deriving these two control points here, um, but you can uh, look into the theory of Bezier curves and convince yourselves that with these four given uh, parameters as defined here, we will a, be able to derive uh, feasible x dot, y dot, theta dots for all t for a differential uh, drive robot. 
And so finally, what we, are, what we end up with is we have our state in, in X and Y, so in planar space, that is given to us through this um, equation or through the analytical formulation of Bezier curves that is parameterized through our uh, P1 to P4. And the curvature of this uh, Bezier curve is, is given to us through te the, the equation for theta dot, um, which is equal to this equality that I've noted on this panel. Okay, so this is just an example of how we may want to generate a feasible trajectory for a robot such that the control inputs that we're computing are feasible and satisfy its non honomicity constraints. Okay, so generating busy curves um, may turn out to be complicated in certain scenarios. Um, and so another way uh, of generating feasible motion control consists, consists of a method that we call feedback linearization. So what feedback linearization allows you to do is to abstract the robot as a holonomic point, right? So obviously, Holonomicity is very useful because what holonomicity means, if you re recall our definition of the degrees of mobility, is that we can move the robot in any given direction. So we have no further constraints, essentially treating the robot as a point robot that we can move in any um, of its degrees of freedom, right? And so this would be extremely useful in terms of devising the right equations um, uh, in a more simplified way. So what does feedback linearization build on? So the idea here is to leverage the linear control of a holonomic point P to control a non-holonomic robot, right? And the key idea is to then formulate um, control inputs, uh, U and omega, as a function of the change in, exerted on this holonomic point P, right? And that change would be represented by our X dot sub P and, X, and Y dot sub P, okay? Um, and as you'll note, there is no orientation here that we're using to describe P because it's a holonomic point in planar space, okay? So let's have a look at this schematically. So our control point P here, as you can see, is a distance epsilon away from the robot. Now, what is the intuition behind this schema? So the idea is um, you can imagine that what you're gonna do is you're gonna tie a rod of length epsilon that connects this point P to the robot. And you can think of then moving this point P in a holonomic way while the robot follows it by satisfying its motion constraint, right? So if you think of a horse and a carriage, that's a pretty good analogy because Horses roughly are holonomic vehicles, and the carriage is definitely not a holonomic vehicle, but the horses can move in any way, and they're pulling the carriage such that the carriage can never let us um, satisfy its motion constraints. And clearly, the closer um, or the farther the horses are from the carriage, the easier it is for the horses to move holonomically and, and, and bring along the carriage along the desired trajectories the horses are moving in, right? Um, so yes, uh, as I noted before, epsilon must be non-zero, otherwise we revert to the same scenario we had before where we have holonomicity constraints. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a second, but you can perhaps take a second to think about what happens when epsilon is very small versus when epsilon is very large. So now let's have a look at actually um, implementing a system for feedback li uh, linearization for the platform of a differential drive robot. Okay. So first what we're going to do is we're going to formulate X sub P and Y sub P as a function of the robot state in the world coordinate frame X and Y and theta. Okay. And this is very simple uh, by simply following uh, the geometry of uh, the setup, right? So we can end up with our first set of equations here on the left. And then what we do is we simply derive those equations to give us the change in x um, sub p and y sub p. Now, the next thing that we're going to do, right, is we're going to replace x dot and uh, y dot with u and omega using our forwards equations that we derived previously so that we end up with the control inputs as a function of x sub p dot and y sub p dot. 
right, and also theta. And this basically now describes us how our holonomic point changes its state in space as a function of our control inputs, right? And so this is essentially um, uh, the equation that we were looking for. Now, um, the, the, there are two questions that still uh, remain, right? Which are, how are we to define um, the epsilon here? So how are we going to define the length of our rod? And the second question is, how are we going to compute our desired x sub p dot, right? So by how much do we want to actually move this rod so that the robot does something uh, desirable? So let's have a look at this trajectory um, tracking example. And what we want x sub p to do is to move along this desired trajectory, right? Because if the rod basically is moving or the, this end point of our rod is moving along the desired trajectory, the robot will also move along this desired trajectory, right? And um, the smaller our epsilon, the closer the robot's motion will be to the desired trajectory, dr drawn out by the movement of x sub p, okay? And so what we'll do, similarly to the proportional control law that we saw previously, is we will take the error x sub p minus x sub d, or the other way around, actually, x sub d minus x sub p, we'll multiply that error by a gain, and we will add an x dot um, sub d if the endpoint is actually moving, right? So if we have a desired trajectory where we actually want the robot not just to reach x sub d, but actually to move along with x sub d, we will add um, this term to um, our equation for x sub p dot. And this is basically our control law for our x sub p dot, right? This tells us how we want the control point p to move in time so that we're does, uh, so that the robot is tracking a desired trajectory. Now, clearly we can tune this epsilon. And the question is, well, what happens when epsilon is very small? Well, the nice thing is that the robot will track this trajectory more precisely, but we might end up with very large rotational velocities um, that might eventually become infeasible, right? But in the, on the other hand side, if we have a very large epsilon, this may result in the robot overshooting um, the desired trajectory. So there is a trade-off between small and large epsilon, and there is, unfortunately, no free lunch. Okay. So the final question is, how do we now actually design a trajectory though, so that we can track it, right? And we did have a brief look at um, using Bezier curves to do this, but Bezier curves are just one possible method. Um, the overall strategy towards thinking about how to do this is composed of two steps. The first step consists of thinking about how to pre-compute um, a smooth uh, trajectory, right? And the second step simply consists of um, designing a method that allows the robot to follow this pre-computed trajectory. And this following mechanism or this trajectory tracking can be done in two different ways. It can be done in open loop control or in closed loop control, which is something I will talk about in the remaining few minutes of this lecture. Now, either way, we have challenges with this overall approach. And the challenges are, firstly, that we need to guarantee the feasibility of this pre-computed trajectory given the robot platform's motion constraints, right? And that's where, for example, basic curves come in. Um, we need these trajectories to be adapted um, uh, in terms of what we might be encountering in dynamic, dynamic environments, right? If, if obstacles suddenly appear, this trajectory needs to take into account that we cannot, we, we cannot pass through obstacles. We need to pass around them. And the trajectories must guarantee the smoothness of the resulting um, robot path that is being tracked in terms of kinematic or even dynamic feasibility, right? And we would do this by ensuring the continuity of the first um, derivatives for first order control, for example. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, we will now um, kind of close the loop on this uh, trajectory tracking story by looking in detail how to execute open loop and closed loop control. So the two key control paradigms, as I mentioned, are open loop and closed loop control, right? And so once we have this uh, a given trajectory, um, uh, 
all we need to do now is use these one of these control paradigms that allow the robot to track it. So what is open loop control? Open loop control is, is the simpler version of the two and allows the robot to follow a path blindly by applying pre-computed control inputs. Right? So we're assuming that the robot has the path template and is pre-computing the control inputs so that it remains on this path according to how it thinks it will be moving along this path. Right? So there is a certain blindness in the open loop control paradigm. Closed loop control is the more sophisticated version. And what happens in closed loop control is the robot then follows this path for given small durations in time and continuously observes if anything changes in the world. This could be its own state or potentially even the path state to compute a new um, adapted path or a new adapted control inputs that might look different to the pre-computed ones it had um, stored previously, right? Now, the key thing with closed loop control is um, that we are continuously updating the state of the robot or for example, the state of the world with the true state, right? And so we're assuming that somehow this feedback is given or somehow an oracle can tell us what the true state of the robot is. And that is a key assumption we're making in any closed loop control paradigm, right? So just to loop back and uh, briefly uh, lean on that metaphor again of, um, of robots in their perception um, action loops. And I hope you still recall that little example that I showed you of the robot on the moon. You can think um, intuitively about open versus closed loop control by thinking of, well, if the robot is on the moon and it's not receiving control inputs from Earth, then whilst it's moving forward, it's waiting for these control inputs to come, to come in, it's actually doing open loop control, right? However, if the control frequency update is, is very high and it's getting these control commands from Earth very quickly, then we could even argue that the robot is actually in some closed loop control um, uh, scheme where the robot itself is able to give itself its, its feedback on its state, sending the state to the Earth. The Earth is computing the control commands and sending um, adapted uh, motion um, control commands back to the robot for it to execute, right? So this is how we can um, apply these two ideas of open versus closed loop control to our little example of the robot making action decisions um, in, in the scenario. Okay. So let's have um, a look at a very simple open loop control um, example. So as I mentioned, in open loop control, the robot is executing predefined control inputs, right? So the robot knows what its desired trajectory looks like. It will pre-compute the controls it has to execute for a, a given duration of time um, in order to reach that desired um, endpoint. And it will try to reach that desired endpoint um, in a blind manner, right? Without adapting any of these control inputs. But in reality, what happens is a real robot platform will inevitably deviate from the desired path. And the reasons for this are simply that the world is imperfect, right? So for example, the robot's uh, wheels could be slipping on the ground, the robot's actuators might have slack, or we might have used an abstraction for robots um, kinematics or dynamics that is maybe too coarse, too rough, right? So we're inadequately modeling the robot's kinematic model, and hence there will be deviations that occur, and there will be a, a gap between where we want the robot to end up in and where, where it actually does end up in, okay? Not to mention that there may be disruptions in the environment that change something drastically in the world state, and we may need to recompute um, control commands uh, as a function of those, right? So, Let's try to fix this problem of um, open loop control by thinking of a way of doing closed loop control in a very simple example. So here's the better idea, right? So if the robot somehow has access to feedback, say it can observe its own state or it has um, as it's somehow given its state or true state through an oracle, then it can use that to maintain a desired set point, right? Now, as I mentioned, the key assumption here is that the robot is receiving um, feedback that is, that is truthful, trustworthy on um, its deviation 
for example, from the desired state at a given point in time um, to its actual state at that given point in time. So if we look at this little drawing here, the robot is tracking this um, dotted line and it's supposed to be on the solid line. And so we have this deviation um, schematized by this little red um, gap there that the robot can observe. So that's the feedback that is given to the robot. And so simply a very basic uh, closed loop controller here could be, well, if we detect an overshoot um, perhaps to the right of the desired uh, trajectory, then we simply have to correct towards the left and vice versa, right? So this very simple form of a closed loop controller is called on-off or bang-bang um, control, right? And in between these control corrections, obviously what the robot was go is going to do is just simply um, move forwards for a given distance. We can very simply implement such a controller with a very, very simple um, program. So here is a rough sketch of what pseudocode might look like for such a simple um, bang bang controller. Um, so here what we see is if the error is negative, then we perceive the robot being too far left of the desired trajectory. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the left and right motor speed so that the robot turns to the right, right? If the error is positive, then this means that the robot is too far right, and we're going to set the motor speeds on the left and right wheels um, accordingly to turn the robot to the left. If the error is zero, then we're just right, and we're going to continue moving forwards, right, along the trajectory. And so this is how simple a bang-bang controller could be in a closed-loop um, control paradigm. Now, the problem with bang-bang control is that it creates oscillatory uh, behavior. So, for example, if you think of the robot trying to track a straight line, then effectively it will end up tracking it in zigzag motion. Now, the question is, can we do better? And, uh, well, the answer is yes, and there are two simple ideas we could try to use in order to um, alleviate the issues with bang-bang control. So the first idea would be to reduce the turning angle. Um, and the second idea could be to check more frequently for errors in, uh, in the robot's uh, state, right? But actually, this is not really enough to, to help or reduce the, the zigzag uh, behavior um, uh, the, the artifacts resulting from this bang-bang um, type of control. And so I'm going to try to introduce to you a better type of controller. And so the idea of this a new type of control, which we're calling proportional control or P-control, is to now try to adjust um, or compute the error, but to, to adjust for this error um, as a function of the error, right? So, and the hope that we have in doing so is that these adjustments, since they're made with respect to the error, will get smaller as the error gets smaller and smaller, right? So if we look at this pseudo equation here, we have an error which is equal to um, our distance to the desired trajectory, and our turning control will be a function of this error. Now, clearly, again, we have this question of how do we tune um, the control gain k, and there are methods in control theory that we can use um, to estimate or to tune this value, or for very simple systems, we may be able to also tune these uh, by hand. So what does a, a P controller look like in some very simple pseudocode? So here we start by computing our error, which is the reference minus the measured distance. Um, our control value will be simply um, a gain multiplied by this error. And this power that we've just computed will then be assigned to our left and right motors, right? So this is our P controller. Now, unfortunately, there are a few disadvantages uh, to pure proportional control. Um, unfortunately, with p-control, often the robot does not actually reach the reference a distance uh, due to unmodeled artifacts. For example, friction. So the main drawback of p-control is that as the closer you get to the set point, the less it actually pushes you towards that set point. point. So eventually, it doesn't even push hard enough in, in order to move um, the variable you're trying to move. So the process can run continuously close to the set point, but never really quite reaching it. 
So to understand why this happens, you could, for example, consider what happens when the robot is very close to a reference distance. Um, and it could, for example, be trying to move up a hill or so. And this error will be very, very small. And consequently, the power setting will be very low, so low that the robot will actually no longer be able to overcome its internal friction, um, for example, in the motors. Um, and eventually, the robot will then stop moving and will not reach the set point. Alternatively, you may think, well, how about if we just set very high gains? But again, this is not desirable since it can lead uh, to controller instability. Now, the key idea is to extend proportional control to include two further components. Um, an I component and a D component, right? So integral and derivative. Where the analogy here, or the metaphor, is that P represents our present error, I represents our past error, and D represents our future error, or how fast the error is changing, right? So the P error measures how far the, the um, proportional um, uh, the, the, the controller or the control point is actually away from the set point. The integral term would then sum the error to determine how long our vehicle has been away from the set point. And the derivative term would then assess how fast the error in our process is changing. So for example, if the rate of error change is decreasing, this third component would be negative, right? So um, the PI solution is, so only considering the, um, the, the proportional and the integral components, would, for example, in, in the presence of a friction or a moving object, would allow the error to be integrated over time and cause a higher motor power to be set, right? And this would then allow the robot to overcome uh, this increasing um, deviation and ultimately converge to the desired reference point or set point. Now, the problem with the PI controller is that um, the integration of this error might, may start from an initial state when the robot is very far from the object. And as the robot then appro approaches this reference distance, this integral um, term of the controller will already have a very large value. And to decrease this value, the robot's mu robot must actually move past the reference distance so that there are errors of the opposite sign, right? Because we're trying to decrease this error. And that then results in oscillatory behavior. And that's where the D component comes in, because the derivative acts as a break or a dampener on the control effect. For example, if the rate of error change is decreasing, this third um, component will be negative. And so this is how these three components, or P, I, and D, come together um, to produce a very smooth and elegant uh, control. So I'm just really giving you a little bit of a snapshot of PID control, and clearly within the field of control theory, there is a lot of literature on how to tune the, the, the various gains um, uh, that compose uh, the terms here uh, with respect to our PI and D, um, and I encourage you or invite you to have a look at that, um, but will not, this will not feature as a, a detailed part of, of this particular uh, lecture. So I'd just like to finish off by summarizing the pros and cons of open loop versus closed loop control. Um, so closed loop control is clearly the much more robust version because it's robust um, uh, to external perturbations. For example, if we have noisy sensors and we get wrong estimates of our goal position, or even if the feedback tends to be a little noisy, closed loop control will allow us to adapt to this and to um, correct for any um, noise in our um, estimates at any point in time. Closed loop control also allows us to in incorporate unforeseen events. So if our trajectories that are pre-computed need to be adapted, given that potentially um, uh, the, the road does not look as we thought it would look or obstacles suddenly appear, we can do this with closed loop control. Now, open loop control is not unuseful. It's, it's particularly useful when we actually cannot provide the feedback that we need in order to facilitate closed loop control. So sometimes sensors cannot actually operate under certain circumstances. So think, for example, of uh, underwater vehicles that once they're uh, during the times that they're actually underwater, they don't have access uh, to global positioning systems, right? And they only get access to these systems when they surface. So 
during the times when they're actually underwater, they have to operate under open loop control paradigms. So it is interesting to develop more sophisticated means of doing open loop control in scenarios when this is the only possible um, uh, paradigm we can lean on. Other situations might be constrained. For example, we just simply have limited bandwidth. We cannot speak to the given Oracle that is providing us with the feedback we need, um, or simply that the robot platform has limited computational resources. So there are the, those are other reasons why sometimes closed loop control um, is restricted. So finally, I just want to conclude by providing you two pointers to further reading um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about any of the topics that we touched